Welcome to Sideline Sanity with me, Michelle Tafoya, sponsored by Legacy Precious Metals. There has never been a better time to invest in precious metals. Go to LegacyPMInvestments.com, LegacyPMInvestments.com. Today, we're going to talk golf, Saudi Arabia, Phil Mickelson, murder, and blood money. For nearly three decades, she's reported the action from the sidelines. She started very young. She's covered the NBA, NFL, Olympics, and the college football and basketball national championships. And now, during these insane times in our world, Michelle Tafoya thinks we need a serious dose of sanity. This is Sideline Sanity with your host, one of the sanest people on planet Earth, Michelle Tafoya. Well, who better to talk to about this golf kerfuffle, if we can call it that? It, 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 Christine Brennan is with me. You've seen her sports writing everywhere. You see her on TV a lot. She's one of the premier sports writers in America. I'm so glad to have her to talk about this live golf organization. Um, you know what, Christine? I, I think a lot of people aren't really totally clear on what all of this is. And so I want to start there. We all know the USGA. We know the PGA. So in your words, what is live? Michelle, it's great to be with you. And yes, what a story. And uh, kind of it kind of popped up out of nowhere a few weeks ago, even though it, if, if those who follow golf very closely, it's been building for a while. But live golf is an alternative golf tour, uh, kind of exhibition style, no cut, 54 holes, not 72 holes, but um, uh, an alternative golf tour that has uh, plenty of money because it is backed by the Saudis. And they're plucking off uh, top names from the PGA golf tour to go play for this Saudi golf tour. Now it is not actually in Saudi Arabia. The first tournament was in London a few weeks ago. The next one is coming up in Portland, Oregon. They'll have one in Chicago. They'll have one at Donald Trump's course in Bedminster, New Jersey, which should be a fascinating story. Uh, mm -hmm. And they have several others around, around the world. And, and it's a very short tour, but the money is so significant that people like Phil Mickelson, Dustin Johnson, Bryson DeChambeau, now Brooks Kepka uh, have decided to go and be on that tour. What that means is they are then banned by the PGA Tour, which a few weeks ago said, if you're playing the Live Golf Tour, you're not playing our tour. You are suspended from our tour, said the PGA. And But it, right now they can play the majors. So several of those big names were at the US Open, which I covered uh, a week ago in Boston. They will probably be at the British Open in a couple of weeks. And then the Masters, Augusta Nationals on the clock for next April whether they would allow these renegade breakaway golfers, so to speak, to come and play at the Masters. So that that's one of the key questions. Yeah. So live in Roman numerals stands for 54. They play 54 holes. That's, that's the connection. That's what everyone should think about when they see that LIV. And as you mentioned, this is Saudi funded. They're, they have limitless amounts of cash to throw at these golfers, which is why some of these golfers like Sergio Garcia and Phil Mickelson, whom you mentioned, who are sort of in the you know bottom of the eighth of their careers, are saying, yeah, I'll take a hundred million bucks to go play for you and only play 54 holes and get private jetted everywhere and have my caddy treated like royalty and not really have to work that hard because... I'm in the sunset of my career and what have I got to lose? But there's a principle at work here as well. And there have been a few stand-up golfers like Tiger Woods, like Rory McIlroy, who have said, I'm not going. What is the principle as you see it, Christine? I think there are actually two, Michelle. You've, you've certainly outlined it very, very well. There's a sports side of this and there, and there's the geopolitical side. And you know, oh boy, geopolitics, just what we want to talk about in sports. But yeah. you know, but here we are, you know, you, we deal with what we're given as journalists and as broadcasters, as you well know, and, and from your long and wonderful career as well. And so first I'll tackle the sports side. And that is the competition, the, the thrill of going against the best. It's something certainly that, again, you and I have covered, have been so fortunate in our careers to see at the Olympic Games, to see it at the Super Bowl, uh, at college football championship games, college sports in general, women's, men's, uh, Wimbledon, men's, women's, again, on and on it goes, where you see the best going against the best. PGA Tour, there's no doubt, 
it's that's the best competition. Uh, they still have obviously most of the great golfers, certainly as you alluded to, the golfers who are in their prime, as opposed to people like Phil Mickelson or Sergio, who are who are definitely in the bottom of the eighth, as you said, or maybe what it, would that be in golf terms, the uh, 13th or 14th hole uh, right. of their careers. And so, um, so competitively, just wanting to go against the best, the, the key thing, I think, for people who follow golf or maybe don't follow it that much, but understand what a cut is, that means obviously halfway through a tournament, the uh, the best golfers move on. The ones who haven't played as well get cut and go home and get nothing from the PGA yeah. Tour. Well, at right. Live Golf, there's no cut. So, of course, it's just, you know, as you said, kick back and, you know, free money and just enjoy the ride, almost like an exhibition. So, and yeah. and you had people like Roy McIlroy and John Rahm speaking eloquently at the U.S. Open last week just about this, about wanting to go against the best and and also the tradition of playing in a tournament that Jack Nicklaus won, Arnold Palmer won, Tom Watson won, you know, just the uh, Tiger Woods, of course, has won, that you want to go back to those sites and play those tournaments. That's the PGA Tours argument and that's the golfer's argument. And then and I'll try to keep it to a, a minimum. But then there's, of course, the issue of the money. And as you know, I've written quite a few columns about this and, and talked about this also on air. And, it, you know, it's it's backed by the Saudi Investment Fund. That's that is funding the Live Golf series. And the Saudi Investment Fund is run by MBS. That's Mohammed bin Salman, who human rights organizations, CIA, all you know, U.S. sources, all of them say that MBS was responsible and ordered the murder and dismemberment of Jamal Khashoggi, the Washington Post journalist, in 2018. So there's that. Throw that into the mix. Obviously, I've called it blood money. Um, I've called it Saudi blood money. It gets very, very tangled when we've got the president of the United States going to Saudi Arabia, when we've got other sports and other athletes uh, playing in Saudi Arabia and taking their money. I do see a difference, which we can get into. But um, bottom line is that's the issue on the financial side where the money is coming from. It's really interesting. And, and I think Phil Mickelson, who was he was the first one to say yes to this tournament, correct? First really and, big name, yeah, that we care. First really big name, and he took a lot of backlash. Uh, I mean, he is he is hearing it from all sides, except for maybe his family. But he is he is hearing it that you're taking you're taking blood money. Um, what have you observed about Phil, the response to him, and his sort of reaction to the response? Yeah. You know, I was in that press conference. It was Monday of the U.S. Open week. I, I flew up there uh, early to make sure I was there for the one o'clock press conference. And Phil, I, I've covered Phil a long time. And Michelle, I want to say this right off the top. I really like Phil Mickelson. We have gotten along. Um, he's called me once on the phone to thank me for a column I wrote about the, uh, the breast cancer struggles of his wife, Amy, and his mom, which was happening at the same time a decade or so ago. Um, lovely phone call. Uh, Amy, his wife, is terrific. You know, most most of the wives or girlfriends or the partners, significant others of golfers run the other way when they see journalists, <laughs> uh, which, <laughs> which I might too, right? If I were yeah. if I were one of them. Um, and uh, Amy Mickelson comes towards you and big hug and how are you? And we chat and I lost both my parents to cancer a while ago in their 70s. Nothing, you know, overly tragic, but obviously sad. She always remembers that. And we talk about that. And how, how's your family doing? You know, things like that. That's Amy Mickelson. Yeah. So I want to say to your listeners and viewers, I I like Phil. I like Amy. I've always gotten along with them. And I've always been very, very um, supportive and, and positive towards Phil and Columns. I mean, that that is a fact, much more so than Tiger Woods, for example. I say that as a prelude to what I'm going to say now. Phil didn't even look like himself or act like himself in that press conference. He didn't, uh, I mean, I'm not even talking about the beard and whatever, that's fine, whatever you want to do. But he just, his eyes looked hollow. He he was snippy and defensive and it just, it wasn't Phil. Now I understand, and you and I both understand that he's getting it from all sides, as you said. So any human being might be, have their guard up and might not be their old happy self. I get that. Right. He's made a decision, um, you know, estimates are what, 150 to $200 million. That's extraordinary money uh, that it he is. took it. Um, so I asked, I'll just speak for what I did. I, I asked a question for, of him and I, what I did was, um, and, and maybe, you know, people heard it because I know it got played around a lot on the internet. I said to him that as he knows, 9-11 families had written a letter 
um, being to him and to Dustin Johnson and a few of the others Americans who'd gone to the Live series about uh, basically how dare they? Do they realize what the Saudi involvement in 9-11 was? And they, the families wrote this letter, it went on for several paragraphs. I read a couple sentences back to Phil from that and he cut me off. That's fine. I, I've been cut off a lot. You've probably been cut off a lot yeah. over asking questions. Yeah. It wasn't a short question, so I get that. But as someone pointed out to me later, Michelle, I was actually reading the passages of the 9-11 families when he cut me off. So it's me talking, but I am reading the words of 9-11 families. Yeah. Take that, yeah. you know, take that, I, you know, for what it's worth. If that bothers you, great. Right. If it doesn't, fine. I was not bothered at all. I'm doing my job. So he goes, I, I know, I know I've read it. Is there a question? He didn't say, I know. I know. He said, I've read it. Is there a question in there? And I said, yes, there is. And I said, how would you explain what you've done going to the Live Golf Series, taking the Saudi money, not to me, not to us, but to them, the 9-11 families. And he proceeded to talk about his empathy and his sympathy to the 9-11 families, but never answered the question of how he would explain himself. And, and that's okay. He doesn't have to answer any question, but right. I gave him an opportunity and he, he did not take it. He, he, he passed. Yeah. It, it's, this is where <laughs> people say, follow the money. But I'm fascinated by your observations of an athlete you know very well, a celebrity you know well, looking so different. And I can only imagine that this must be taking a toll because it is so public. It is so um, riddled with political difficulty and, and pain. And I, I think, you know, when some of these athletes have said, no, I'm not going to do this for this exact reason, they're taking the moral high ground. And then if you just say, okay, take emotions out of it, take all your emotions out of it, you're a golfer who is, you've done everything you can possibly do in the game of golf. You're, you're in the twilight of your career and you get an opportunity for you and your caddy and your family to travel the world first class, play fewer tournaments, be guaranteed a payday, make this money along the way. And you're set for life and your family's set for life. Would you do it? And you know, me, I would not because I, I just, money doesn't mean as much to me, but at the same time, the, it, 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 it is partly emotional and it is partly a fiscal decision. And it's very human to, uh, to see how people might respond to this offer as clearly some of them have. But the other thing that, that, that the live series does that, you know, the, the PGA tour does not, it offers some other interesting perks. Some of you you've mentioned, we're going to take a quick break and talk about other reasons that maybe the PGA tour wants to look at, at just the golf side of this and say, could we make this a better place for golfers to want to be? We'll talk about that with Christine Brennan next. You know what I learned that really bothered me? 85% of the grass-fed beef in stores and online is imported from overseas. 85%. So you could be paying a premium price for low-quality foreign meat. Two words for you. Good Ranchers. They guarantee 100% American meat delivered right to your door. Good Ranchers helps you solve the meat problem and lets you support American farms and ranchers with every purchase. You can shop them for all your beef, chicken, seafood needs. I'm talking ribeyes, T-bones, chicken, salmon, and their beef earns the highest USDA grade possible. Good Ranchers sells 100% American meat and ships it straight to your door. And right now, check this out. They're giving away two free 18 ounce prime center cut ribeyes to every person that uses my code TAFOYA, T-A-F-O-Y-A. That's over two pounds of prime ribeye. I mean, start the summer off right. You can make a one-time purchase or you can subscribe and then you save 25 bucks on every box. And like I said earlier, there are those two free 18 ounce boneless ribeyes. Other places would charge you 50, 60 bucks a pop. Not good ranchers. They're giving them to you when you use my code TAFOYA, they are out of their ranching minds. But this is a limited stock, first come, first serve, so get to it. They deliver the best of American farms and ranches to your door. Make sure you take the time today, right now. Go to goodranchers.com slash TAFOYA or use TAFOYA at checkout to get your two free 18-ounce ribeyes. Start the summer off right with Good Ranchers American Meat Delivered.
So back with Christine Brennan talking about golf, the PGA versus the Live Series, that Saudi-backed series. My understanding, and you probably know more about this than I do, is that the PGA invited players to have a meeting recently and talked about how can we make this tour somewhere that you want to stay? And how can we avoid this Live Series from plucking a bunch of you away as we're seeing happen? What can we do to reward you better, make this the place for the best golfers, because the last thing the PGA wants to do is dissolve and go away because there's not enough money in the PGA to compete with this Live Series, right? Oh, that's right. I mean, the Saudi business model is completely unsustainable in terms of like trying to get your money back. That's not what they're doing. And that's why, of course, the term sports washing has come up so many times, including from me, that, you know, clearly you're spending this kind of money you're not going to get that money back from Phil. So what is the money for, you know, it, to have Phil help you uh, burnish your image and your PR and all of that. So, okay, that's that's a big part of that. And that's, uh, in fact, it, to me, the biggest part. But you're right. Um, again, going back to the kind of the sports structure of it all, the PGA Tour, you know, this, this is not good. This is not good for the PGA Tour. And one might have thought they could have foreseen this coming sooner and maybe addressed issues of their players sooner. Um, I do think that, you know, when you look at this, one of the things they're talking about moving forward is a fall series for the players on the PGA Tour where they would be guaranteed money. So, you mm-hmm. you know, kind of like the appearance fee situation uh, to right. try to answer Live Golf. It won't be the kind of money that Live Golf is throwing around, but um, to keep everyone happy and to show them that there are obviously changes in the works. But things like uh, having tournaments where there's no cut, well, they do have some of those. And if you have a small kind of fun hit and giggle, as Tiger Woods calls them, uh, yeah. golf tournament, they are already some in December. We know Tiger played with his son, you know, those kind of tournaments. Yeah. Have, have yeah. more, though, that are um, not quite like that, that are more real, so to speak, more competitive, but also have it be guaranteed money. Uh, and listen more to the players. What do they want? Do they want to have more time off? Do they want to be able um, to have more freedom in what they're doing? I think, you know, clearly the issue is now joined. You know, this is this is a there's a civil war going on in golf. Yeah. And and they've got to come up with some answers. And the PGA Tour is doing its best. Of course, keep in mind the TV partners, you know, as, as well as I, you know, this is not making those partners of golf, of the PGA Tour happy to find out that, oh, you'll never have Brooks Kepka in a PGA tournament again, PGA Tour tournament. Right. You know, you, right. you potentially will never have a Bryson D. Shampoo. Now, your grandmothers, you know, who stopped their lives on Sunday afternoons for Tiger Woods are not doing that for those guys. They play right. Tiger, Phil, maybe Rory and Jordan Spieth, right? But those are right. the guys that move the needle. But still, if you're a golf broadcaster, you can't afford to lose too many more of these people before you're screaming at the PGA Tour to do something as well. What is your understanding, Christine, of why the people who are saying no are saying no, like Tiger Woods, like Rory? I, I think, um, you know, you said it a few moments ago before the break about that you personally wouldn't take the money. I personally would never take the money. I've got, you know, we're, we're lucky. We're lucky kids, you and I. Uh, and I know yeah. I don't forget. I know you don't either. Take, so for, we've worked very hard, but we're fortunate. And, you know, that kind of money probably well, maybe life altering, maybe not, but we don't want it. Well, that's what John right. Rahm, for example, John Rahm, who won the U.S. Open last year, uh, as he was defending his title last week in Boston, he said, if someone gave me another $200 million, that would not change my life. He said, I could quit today and uh, never play golf, never pick up a club, and my life is set. He said, my wife and I have talked about it. It's a beautiful life, all of that. So I think that's part of it that, first of all, they're making tons and tons of money. They're multi, right. multi-millionaires. Right. And, you know, while I'm a capitalist, you're a capitalist, I believe in making as much money as you want to make. And by the right. way, Phil has every right to do what he's doing. I have every right then to do my job and to criticize him, right? Yes. Um, so I want to make that clear. I mean, of course, that's that's capitalism. That's the American way. I'm all for it. But at some level, guys like Roy McIlroy or, Phil, or, or Tiger would say, I, I, I'm doing great. I've got enough. And by the way, Rory's going to make a lot more. Uh, Tiger is making a lot more. They have sponsors, obviously, <laughs> off of yeah. the course that pay them too. So these guys are all making a lot of money. And I think they just decided, again, the competition. They want the real serious competition, which is on the PGA tour. 
You used a term that we're going to discuss further after the break. It's called sports washing. It's a really interesting term, and you can apply it to the Olympic Games, to the NBA, to China, to this. We'll get into it because this this issue is not brand new, and it doesn't seem to be going away. And I keep asking myself, who's going to win, good or evil? We'll let Christine give us her prognostication next. Well, you know, since November of last year, the stock market has absolutely plummeted. It is as volatile as it's ever been, but gold has been on the rise. Meanwhile, gas prices are ridiculously insane. The stock market, as I said, so volatile. Inflation is worse than it was a year ago. And we've got this war going on between Russia and Ukraine that we can only pray doesn't spread any further than that. The markets don't like this instability, but the good news is you have options and I want to make you aware of them. Gold prices are rising as investors turn to gold for protection. Gold provides a hedge against inflation and protects against a weakening dollar. Legacy Precious Metals, LPM, Legacy Precious Metals is the only company I trust for investing in gold and silver because you need an investment that's going to protect your wealth and your retirement. Call Legacy Precious Metals today. You want to be proactive while there's still time. I hate to remind you of 2008, but remember then those who invested in gold saw huge gains and others, they simply lost their retirements. Legacy Precious Metals can advise you on all of your options for investing in gold and silver. You have nothing to lose by giving them a call and just asking them some basic questions. And you can speak to an IRA expert at Legacy Precious Metals at 866-528-1903, 866-528-1903, or download their free investor's guide at LegacyPMInvestments.com, LegacyPMInvestments.com. All right. Sports washing. I love this term. Go ahead, Christine. Tell us what it means. You know, Michelle, I I heard it what, a few months ago, maybe. I guess it's been around for four or five years. I must have missed it. Uh, but uh, <laughs> that's OK. I did, too. I did, too. But I love it now that I know Me it. Me, too. I think, you know, we're kind of the age that, you know, you miss some of these things. that all, You know, I'm, I'm sure <laughs> if I talked to, you know, my nieces, they would have had been all over it. Um, but yeah. anyway, so here it is. It's with us. And it's it's a very serious term. And it, you know, instead of whitewashing, you know, someone's reputation or image, it would it's sports washing. It's meaning using sports to help your image, to uh, to help people forget the bad things you've done, to uh, <laughs> to to, uh, you know, cover up. Um, you could even say to bribe people like bribe yeah. an athlete to come and be a part of your business, to go into business, in this case with MBS and to help him burnish his image, be a part of the PR team to make people say, oh, hey, Phil's doing this. Maybe they're not all bad. Or, you know, Sergio, right. I like to, right. you know. Th- th- I love Sergio. So really, this isn't, this can't be that bad, can it? Because Sergio wouldn't be a part of it if it were something that bad. Exactly. And of course, Phil said it himself when he had that interview uh, for the, uh, the book on, on, you know, that's out now uh, on him, where he said, uh, you know, they're, 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 I don't, what do we say, ter- terrible, whatever, mean, mother blankers and uh and they killed Khashoggi and they you know uh, are terrible for gay rights but I'm going to go into business with them you know which of course was quite a comment and that's what he apologized continues to apologize for even though of course yeah. Michelle he went into business with them so he went into yeah, business with them so he described it I think pretty well yeah so we've you and I have talked about this about you know some of these authoritarian dictatorship countries like Russia like China, getting the Olympic Games. Nothing angers me quite like this does because we all know what's going on in China. There's genocide there. there there's slavery there. And yet the Beijing Olympics, la, la, la. Well, this time the ratings reflected that p- people didn't want any part of this. You know, I think people are starting to understand more and more. The ratings for Beijing were not good. Russia, Sochi, the Olympics there. What happens afterward? They take over Crimea. So... You know, if, if it were me and I was the head of the, the, the IOC, I'd say, OK, we're going to have the Olympics in places that are free. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, Australia, Sydney was the best, uh, the United States. 
places in Europe, you know, NATO partners, what, all of these places that you can have them. And it just reflects this corruption of the IOC that, again, the Olympics, the Olympics are, are this bastion of purity and, you know, competition worldwide and coming together and the whole holding hands and all of that in countries where often to the far distance people are getting tortured. Uh, it just, it, it infuriates me. What, yeah. It infuriates. Well, why does the IOC do this? Yeah, what infuriates me as well, and as 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 you know, we and I have covered many many Olympics uh, together and bump into each other and for that quick yeah. second and say hello. And I was in China. I was in Beijing in February for three, yeah, a little bit more than three weeks. And um, I was asking these questions of the IOC. I was asking them about the Peng Shui controversy, which they were sports washing, covering up, trying to help yep. the Chinese with that. That was basically the world's biggest Me Too story. The uh, WTA tennis player who went on social media in China saying she had been sexually assaulted by a former Chinese uh, top political leader. And then that disappeared. And then she disappeared. And, yeah. and we still haven't seen, she still hasn't talked to the WTA, which of course defended her to the point. Talk about where you look for your role models. The WTA, mm -hmm. Steve Simon, the CEO who pulled out uh, uh, the WTA out of China and lost, yes. losing millions potentially to say, no, we're not going to do business with you. So there, for those who are saying, well, what about you know all this stuff? Well, not you, but others. There's an example. The WTA said, we don't care. We're going to lose business because we're not going to keep our, our tennis tournaments in China. Bravo. Bravo to them. What a what a seminal moment that will be studied 50 or 100 years from now about leadership and doing the right thing, a master class in leadership. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. The reason is you probably know, but it's probably worth mentioning for a moment. The reason that the Olympics were in Beijing and that I was in Beijing in February 2022 is because seven, eight years earlier, Norway, which was the favorite for the 2022 Winter Olympics, which would have been perfect, as we know, for many mm. reasons, how beautiful yeah. it is. Obviously, it's, 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 it's government, it's political stances, et cetera. Norway pulled out, basically told the IOC they didn't want to accede to their demands for more roads and environmental issues like building hotels, things the Norwegians didn't want to do, and go, went and told the IOC to jump in the lake. So at that point, there were two cities left, Michelle, at bidding to host the 2022 Winter Olympics, Almaty, Kazakhstan, and Beijing, China. <laughs> and that is why, the very practical reason why, Beijing became the first and only city in the grand history of cities hosting the Olympics summer and winter, the only one to host a Summer Olympics and a Winter Olympics ever, only one, Beijing. How awful is that, that this capital of this reprehensible regime uh, that just so awful. You described it for so many reasons, the human rights abuses, the murders, the, the atrocities of China, and they get to be the one city and the one country that's hosted both, obviously, Beijing in 08 for the summer games and then right. for the winter. And you know me, I blasted that every which way I could in <laughs> USA Today, on CNN, on Good Morning America. And I will do that till people take away my last microphone and my last you know, uh, laptop to, to write. It was just awful. Uh, they should have reopened the bidding. They should have done something. They should have looked at Salt Lake. They should have looked at, uh, you know, in the French Alps, done something to not yeah. that happen. Yeah. And, you know, I left NBC right before those Olympics started and I and I I wouldn't have gone had they asked me to go for that very reason. But it's beyond we're going to stay on China for a second before we wrap here, because earlier this week I had on Annis Cantor Freedom, as you know, an NBA player who was traded from Boston to Houston and promptly cut and understands and accepts that he will probably never play in the NBA again because of his stance on China and his refusal to back down from criticizing China. He's become an American citizen. He was raised in Turkey. He understands all of this horrid stuff that's going on. And when he was originally, Christine, he t I didn't realize this. When he originally took NBA courts with shoes protesting stuff in Turkey, according to him, Adam Silver was like, hey, we got you. We're behind you. We support you all the way. When it turned to China and shoes protesting the stuff going on with Uyghurs, et cetera, all hell broke loose for him. And his teammates would say to him secretly, according to him, hey, we love what you're doing. And he'd say, join me. And they'd say, I got a shoe deal. I can't. So the NBA 
is a is a big culprit in this thing. And I just wonder there it's such a huge business over there in China. But at, at what cost? Like I don't understand how this American organization, the NBA, can can live with itself. Why do you think they can? Uh, you know, Michelle, I'm with you. I wrote a column, a couple of columns uh, about this. Uh, when I, I mentioned the NBA, every time I talked about Peng Shui. So when that story was blowing up last fall into this early this year, uh, talking about how the WTA handled it so beautifully, as I mentioned a few moments ago, and how the NBA and others and the IOC, I lumped the NBA in with the IOC. I heard from NBA PR people. They were not happy. I said, prove to me that I'm wrong. And of course, they could not. So I'm with you and I have put my money where my mouth is. You know, I have I have yeah. said it. In, yeah, you have. In, and I will continue to do that. And I also was very critical of LeBron James a few years ago. Remember when Daryl Morey spoke out on behalf of the protesters in Hong Kong, obviously protesting for democracy. Yeah. <laughs> and and um, all of a sudden the NBA got all skittish and weird about that. And then LeBron basically had a terrible answer about, mm -hmm. uh, you know, Worry, you know, worrying about Daryl Morey's comments. I forget the exact comments, but it was the gist of it being on the side of China. That was the gist of what LeBron said. And I laid into him in a full column, USA Today, and I got a call from NBA PR while I was watching my niece play volleyball over across the river in McLean, Virginia. I'm here in D.C. And I, uh, after a, I missed one point, I said, I'm going to call you back uh, after I finished watching my niece play. Point is, they were hopping mad. So, when people get mad at me and do the what about ism on Twitter, uh, you know, how dare you? You're focusing on golf. Why not focus on the NBA? Of course, I focused on the NBA when, yeah. when you know, right at this point, I'm at the US Open, I'm covering golf. And so I wish, last thought on this big picture, what I've written about the IOC and I and others probably have too, but I'll speak for myself. The International Olympic Committee has this great gift that Beijing wanted in 08 and in 2022. Why not hold it out? and demand things or threaten to move it and then get action from China. In other words, to just cave in to China. When you hold this great gift as an organization, the International Olympic Committee, China, NBA as well, I so wish Adam Silver would look at them and say, you need us more than we need you. Yes. And, if, and, and all of a sudden extract some major demands for human rights and all these other things that we're talking about that are sitting there for some league like the WTA, which did it, for the NBA yeah. to follow suit or the IOC and say, no more, in, you know, literally, we're going to pull out of China, which I know would be yep. billions of dollars. But you know what? We're going to be dead in four, 30, 40, 50, 60, whatever years. If someone's 20 watching us and listening, then they're going to hopefully that's going to be 80, you know, 80 years from now. But we're going to be yeah. dead. And what are people going to say about us? You know, for the NBA, for the IOC, this is your legacy, folks. And um, just doing it for the money, it's going to be remembered forever. And why not actually focus on these things that we're talking about and do the right thing and stand up for those people who are voiceless? The NBA has a huge voice. The IOC has a huge voice in China. Uh, and really, really call them on the carpet and hold out that thing they want so dear, that gorgeous package the IO that the Chinese want, the Olympic Games, the NBA. And these organizations, instead of holding it out and, and asking for those demands, they cave every time, Michelle. I write about it and talk about it every time, but it's so darn frustrating as an American to watch yeah. these organizations not live up to what, the, what we would hope they would live up to, the values, the morals, and the decency of fighting for those who can't fight for themselves. I don't even want to add anything more because that is so well said, Christine, and bravo, and uh, I will support every column. I've got to start retweeting everything you write because it is so hugely important. Like, when are we going to follow the moral compass instead of following the money? I think we'll all be better off. I think people will sleep better and be happier humans if they take the moral high, high ground. And uh, gosh, I can't thank you enough. I, I hope that people pay attention to this Live Golf series and to all of these issues because we demand a lot of ourselves as Americans. We continue to punish ourselves for our own history, and yet it's happening in other places, and we're not saying anything, or we're producing our goods over there, or as you said, handing them the gift of the Olympic Games. Shame on us. Shame on the IOC. Christine Brennan, it's a pleasure, and I thank you so much for your viewpoints today. Michelle, my pleasure. Thanks so much, friend, and good to see you, and good to talk. Thanks for having me. 
This has been Sideline Sanity. I'm Michelle Tafoya. So with the economy the way that it is, which is not great, makes you think about what is smart investing these days. I was given a gift of gold by my mom. My husband and I were gifted some gold for a wedding anniversary and we're really grateful. And I am really grateful to Charles Thorngren, who grow, who joins us now from Legacy Precious Metals, a sponsor of Sideline Sanity. Charles, we appreciate you so much. You know, we're hearing more and more about how inflation ain't transitory after all, and it may be here a while. And, you know, food shelves are getting, the lines are longer. It, this is really, it's not the America I grew up in, and it's, it's worrying a lot of people. So if, if someone's thinking about investing, what do you tell them? You, you know, it's, it's an interesting conversation. Investing nowadays, uh, we, we want to go back to kind of the basics, really, where diversification has always been key. And, and we hear it. We've been told it ad nauseum. You know, diversify, diversify, and then everyone puts all their money in the stock market and <laughs> wonders why when there's a pullback, they're in trouble. Diversity means asset class diversity as well. You know, some real estate, um, some precious metals. These are the things that give your portfolio the legs to stand through all the storms that will happen financially. And, and, and we know that they happen. They happen continuously and they recur. So that's what diversity is truly meant to do. And that's why people used to talk about diversity. So when people see the value of the dollar declining or they see inflation, um, how do you get the average person like me to understand that gold can still be appreciating or that gold can protect right. against that stuff. How, how does that make sense for people? You know, the, the easiest way to look at it is if you look at gold, right? Gold is the anti-dollar investment. As a dollar gets weaker, gold gets stronger. And we know that because it takes more dollars to buy that gold, just like cars cost more now, right? Um, Anytime you have inflation, the item that you're buying costs more. The difference with gold is that it doesn't devalue. It's considered an alternative currency. Basically, when you say that I don't have complete faith that this financial system is not built on a house of cards, or I don't have complete faith in, in what the current Fed is doing to fight inflation, this is where gold comes in. And this is where we see people increase their amount of gold because a diversified portfolio should have some gold regardless. We need to remember that the United States Fed says 2 to 3% inflation is ideal. So that means for the average saver, if your retirement account's invested and it's based in dollars, that you're going to lose 60% of your purchasing power to inflation by the time you're ready to retire. And that's under the best of terms. And now we can talk about the, oh, it's transitionary. Oh, no, maybe I was wrong. Um, maybe we need to do half basis points every month for the rest of the year and then see where it's at next year. These are scary things that mm -hmm. the experts are trying to tell us that maybe we didn't have it right. And this is why people have gold and this is why it offers that protection. It's interesting. Uh, I, you know, I think people think, well, if I'm investing in gold, do I actually possess the gold in, you know, I have it in a safe. Do I have, how do you get gold? How do you keep gold? Right. And, and physical gold. I mean, this is what we do. So yes, if you're buying it outside of an IRA, we can deliver it right to your home and you can put it in your own safe. You can put it in your safety deposit box. If you don't feel comfortable with that, we do offer storage for our clients as well. OK, so there's lots of options uh, in the IRA. It's stored for you, just like your IRA account. You don't have access to those stocks. So if you were to take funds from your IRA, you could make that investment and you'd have the retirement account invested in the precious metals as well. And it would be handled just like every other IRA account. That's really interesting. And, and now I'm going to ask you a tough one and I hope you'll forgive me, but I'm just going to be candid uh, and, and ask what I think might be coming to people's minds. Sure. If the experts in Washington are making all these mistakes or they were wrong about inflation, then they're going to look at you and say, hey, Charles, why should I trust what you're telling me and why Legacy Precious Metals is the place to go? I I'm asking this in an honest sure. way because I, I, I know you want to be transparent about this stuff. So how would you Absolutely. answer that? You know, it really is, is. I'm not a politician. Um, 
<laughs> I have no desire to be a politician. I like what I do, right? I help people prepare their finances. I help people with their retirements. I help people set up their funds so that their children and their grandchildren have something that's there. This is what I do. This is what I do for uh, enjoyment. Um, uh, very big in economics. Um, um, but metals is that thing that it's an alternative asset, right? When I was a stockbroker 30 plus years ago, it was unique kind of then. And then everybody was a stockbroker and everyone had stocks and there was nothing different. There was no protection. Everyone said the same thing. To me, it didn't make sense for everyone to be doing the same thing. If we all do the same thing, then we all fall together. And we know that if you follow the government's direction, you're buying into whatever they want to sell you. Now, it used to be politics was a little different. We have gotten into a place where we can't say that anymore. It's not always for the people. It's We see that. We see that what they're doing with the economy itself. We know that we have to have something else. And this is why we do what we do here at Legacy. And my history is, is why people should, you know, give us a call, chat with us and see if it makes sense for them. Last thing I want to ask you about is I remember 2008 and I know a lot of people mm -hmm. do. And it, 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 you know, that was a crash and there have been other crashes, but why is it that when the economy crashes, gold has historically risen? I know you said it's sort of the anti-dollar. Right. Is there a way in layman's terms to explain why that happens? It's it's the safe place, right? When, when, when there's so much risk out there and people are losing so much money, they just want safety. Mm -hmm. So l let's look at inflation. We know right now we're running close to eight and a half percent. Yeah. Uh, we can dig some real numbers out there and we can debate that, but we'll just take that number as it is. We'll use 8%. That means everything costs you 8% more this year than it did last year. And we know it's going to go higher because the Fed's already promised us a lot more interest rate raises, right, to fight inflation. But we know it's not enough. When they say things like, we'll try to raise half a basis point five times over the next six months and see where the economy's at next year. That in itself lets you know you need to find something that doesn't put your livelihood in their hands. They're, they're juggling an economy and the stock market, and it was never meant to be that way. So you have to protect yourself. And this is where gold comes in because it is the anti-dollar. The weaker the dollar gets, the stronger gold gets. And, you know, 2008, I remember after it happened, um, the people that would call and try to salvage their retirement accounts. And it was a very devastating time. People would call and they would be crying that they can't retire now. They have to continue to work. They're 67 years old and their plans are gone because they lost half their value. And that's devastating. You know, but this is where those who were involved in gold, they saw gold almost double in price. It offset the losses. It offset the losses. So again, Charles is not suggesting that you put all your money in one place, no. that not even gold, but diversify your assets and precious metals is a good way to go. And legacy precious metals is the only company I trust when I talk about and do my investing in gold and silver, and you can contact them as well. LegacyPMInvestments.com, LegacyPMInvestments.com. I don't know why you would waste another minute thinking about it. Just talk to them. I mean, just ask them, see what your situation can, can manage and handle and might require and just get some answers. Uh, Charles, I appreciate your time. Thanks for this. It's been very educational. My pleasure. My pleasure. Thank you.